As you can see, I'm in a storage bin. This is where the airplane is living now uh, because I had to move. I had to move from Salt Lake City to uh, the Dallas area. Uh, my company is consolidating the whole train department into its headquarters here in Louisville. So uh, I had to pack everything up, put it on the moving truck, and put it here in temporary storage until I find a, a, new, uh, a new house and, of course, new new garage. But in the meantime, I think I gathered enough video here that I can give you the highlights of installing the avionics and electrical systems. In my last video, I left off with the design of the instrument panel. So let's continue with first cutting all the holes. When securing the panel before drilling, I always use fresh masking tape on the backing blocks, then also on the clamps. This prevents any scratches of the soft aluminum from any stray chips or dirt. Step drills are really good at drilling perfectly round holes in thin metal, but they tend to wander off the center if not carefully monitored. That's why I always mark a large cross so I can periodically check that it's still centered. I also use colored markers to indicate significant steps in the drill to keep track while drilling. This way I can tell at a glance the proper hole size, preventing accidentally drilling the hole too large. Larger holes require either an expensive punch, or in my case, a fly cutter, which definitely needs to be secured thoroughly. It's wise to never attempt to hand drill a hole with a fly cutter as you're asking for disaster. Then there's lots and lots of filing and sanding, being sure to always leave a little room for the powder coat thickness. Here I'm making a key notch for the gas prevent so it doesn't rotate when tightening the big nut behind. And as always, I'm constantly cleaning any shavings as I go just to reduce any scratches in the soft aluminum. When mounting the radio racks, there are these little dimples integral to the frames. These keep the proper distance between the racks so they can be just bundled together during mounting. Another neat feature are these holes in the front of each individual radio rack. When a couple of rods are placed through all these holes in the entire stack, all the front bezel faces line up perfectly with each other. Clothes hanger wire works perfectly for this. Then once all the holes and cutouts are done, it's time to click all the panel in place and find locations for all the boxes, or as we call them, LRUs, Line Replaceable Units. It was a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, as usual, but I had plenty of options in three locations, behind the instrument panel, under the co-pilot seat, and under the baggage floor. Always keeping in mind how I'm gonna remove and replace an LRU when the airplane is in service. Since the G3X primary flight display is removed from the front, I'll have all this area to work with, making it easy to service components mounted behind the panel. This is where the Garmin GEA24 engine interface unit is mounted with the connectors facing up. Then on the other radio plate, I'll mount the carbon monoxide detector, which I haven't bought yet because they have a fixed service life. For the heater core, I found this race car defroster unit from a distributor in Ireland. It was a good place to start, but I had to heavily modify it. I added anchor nuts to mount it, replaced the sheet metal screws with real rivets, and covered two of the outlets. I sandwiched it between the stock RANS radio mount plates with the two outlets pointing towards the footwell. I'll later install louver to outlets to direct the hot airflow. I haven't bought the autopilot servos yet, so I don't have their exact mounting figured out. But after fabricating these shelves, cardboard cutouts help locate their placement. The roll servo will mount on the rear plate which will use a capstan and bridle cable arrangement to the aileron cable running down the side. Then the pitch servo will mount on the forward plate, using a push-pull rod arrangement directly to the control stick torque tube. Then the ELT also mounts under the co-pilot seat, making sure it's able to be removed in the field without tools. I fabricated a radio shelf under the baggage floor, where I mounted the Navlite power pack, the battery backup for the PFD, and the Garmin GPS-20A WAS antenna interface unit. Then after the boxes were in place, it was just a matter of running all the wires and building all the connectors. I always use mil-spec aircraft wire and wouldn't even consider anything off the commercial shelf. It's made with tin or silver-plated copper, multi-stranded, and designed to have low-loss connectivity while flexing easily. It's rated for high voltage and the high temp TEF cell insulation provides excellent abrasion resistance. I can't stress enough the importance of using high quality wire. I mounted all the switches and breakers in the panel and labeled each one so as to not lose track of where they are when I'm adding wires behind the panel. Available where drafting supplies are sold, 
I like using these flexible curve rulers to plan out the pigtail service loops and get an idea where to place the anchor points. And also being a ruler, it provides an approximate length of the wire needed as the harness serpentines through the structure. Planning the wire runs like this ensures the harnesses are routed clear of any structures and secured properly to avoid any chafing. Once again, the AC4313 offers guidance for the aircraft builder. It provides detailed methods for both placement of the ADEL clamps and routing of wires through the aircraft. Behind the panel, the plan was to run a spine or backbone harness with all the pigtails running from that to the various components. The backbone was run laterally high across the aft side of the firewall. This provides good height for all the pigtails to hang from and is far away from any structure. I have four antennas on this airplane, their location being dependent on their function. Showing their placement on a completed S-20, the GPS antenna is obviously on top to have a clear view of orbiting satellites. The ELT is also on top, because in a survivable crash situation, the top of the fuselage would likely still be intact, giving the ELT a good chance to function as intended. The transponder antenna is mounted on the bottom boot cowl, both to provide a large metal ground plane and a clear view of ground stations when in flight. Then the bent whip comm antenna is mounted on the bottom, behind the cabin, where it's far away from any other antenna and having a clear view of ground stations for its line of sight signals. And since all those radio signals interfere with each other, to one degree or another, I did my best to keep all those coax cables isolated from each other. And if they did get cozy, I made sure the cables cross at a 90 degree angle, so the signals cancel each other instead of possibly causing constructive interference. Which is what I did here when the comm and GPS antenna cables cross. As I mentioned before, I'm doing my best to run all the electrical wires down the right side of the fuselage, while all the fuel lines run down the left side of the fuselage. I have one exception though for good reason, the transponder antenna. A typical transponder output is greater than 250 watts, and that high power, combined with high UHF frequencies, causes all kinds of mayhem with other receivers. So the trick is to keep transponder antennas, and especially the coax cables to those antennas, as far as possible from anything else electrical, especially GPS or comm coax cables. When securing a harness in an aircraft, the goal here is to not let any wires contact any metal. All aircraft vibrate excessively, even if you can't feel it. The wire insulation is plastic, and if it's in contact with any metal, guess who's going to win? Here are just a few examples of what we call a rat's nest, which at worst is a fire waiting to happen, but eventually down the road these situations will cause intermittent operation, which is always a bear to track down. Even if the wires are seemingly secured tightly to a metal tube, the end will rub against the metal, wearing down the insulation and eventually causing a short. This is one of the biggest culprits, a wire bundle zip tied directly to a metal tube. Here, the bare wires are already rubbing against a sharp metal corner. Guess what's gonna happen? Yeah, and those are the power wires for the fuel pump. Unfortunately, I see this all the time in kit build aircraft. Even in certificated aircraft, like in this PC-12 engine compartment, mechanics don't do it right either, as these wires will short out in due time from vibration. I see it all the time. This is how those wires should be secured, away from any metal. Oh, and don't use these sticky mount anchors. They may seem convenient at first, but after only a few months, the sticky foam dries out and loses its hold, leaving the wires free to rub against anything nearby. Then there's these big box store zip ties, which are garbage. The cheap plastic gets hard over time, becoming very brittle and breaks with the slightest movement. I've seen way too many of these fall apart in my hand and the plastic locking tang doesn't hold and breaks easily. Only the softer, nylon-like polyamide types with steel locking tangs are approved for use in aircraft. Tie Wrap is a popular brand name, and I still call these tie wraps instead of the more generic zip ties. Oh, and when installing tie wraps, only use cutters that are flush on one side. After cinching up by hand, grip the tabs with the cutters, but without cutting through, give it a little twist or two, which tightens the wrap securely, then cut the tab loose. This flush cut removes any sharp tabs. Wire cutters that aren't flush on one side leave these sharp tabs, and sticking your hand up into a panel with those sharp plastic tabs results in lots of blood. But by far the best way to secure wires are those tried and true harness anchors, the ADEL clamps. I made up a kit, which is already overflowing as I buy more of the odd sized ones. They come either with or without a conformal rubber cushion. I use the ones without the cushion when clearance is tight, 
for example, under the fabric, and I have either rubber tape or the powder coat between it and the metal tube. One by one, I added the wires point to point. Making progress all the time, the harness became thicker and thicker as I went along. I usually try to complete a connector each night, closing it out and making sure to label the wires with masking tape tags on the other end. Close to the connectors, I use wax lacing tape to bind the harness into a tight bundle. It makes for a clean look, is less bulky than tie wraps, and preserves the flexibility of the service loop. The AC4313 provides guidance on the various knots. To avoid any ground loops or voltage reference problems, I routed every ground from every component using its own wire to a single grounding block connector, which will then be grounded to the frame at a single point, the upper right firewall feed through bolt. Since the circuit breaker is a termination point of a harness, the right side panel became a collection point. Mounting the circuit breakers and bus bars first, I was able to neatly terminate a wire to its exact length. As I mentioned in my previous video, for future expansion, I drilled extra holes for additional circuit breakers, so I left the bus bar a little long, covering it with spring tubing until I needed it. Always leaving room for expansion, you'll thank yourself someday in the future. The Garmin connectors went together pretty easily, as the Garmin installation manual provides excellent guidance. In the center console are the four headset jacks and intercom music jack, all using shielded wire grounded only at the comm radio. There's a USB charging port, which I also use shielded wire for, since I've heard about people having interference problems. Also the cigarette lighter and quick disconnect for the header tank fuel level switch. The connectors for the engine to laptop interface will be secured to the radio mount plates with the heater fan connector right above. Here are the wires to the carbon monoxide detector. There are a lot of wires going through the firewall, from the engine controls and sensors, power feed, landing lights, nose camera, and much more. The stock hole isn't big enough for all the wires, so I'll cut a second hole when the fuselage is off the rotisserie. Those wires are coiled up here. I'm using two of these one inch firewall penetration kits, and since the inside of the fire sleeve will be potted with fire block sealant, I won't be able to add wires later, so I'm adding spare wires of different types now, especially for that prop control. I'm using these fireproof feed throughs because those plastic, rubber, or aluminum ones would melt within seconds with any type of fire, filling the cockpit with dangerous fumes. The final harness layout turned out pretty well. There is still a lot of cleanup to do, but that'll need to wait for the final installation after the panel is powder coated and labeled. The spine or back bud method is clearly seen here with the major harness far behind the panel with all the pigtails connecting directly to their components through service loops. This technique provides plenty of space for future retrofits or servicing. The coiled up wires here are either going into the engine compartment through that second firewall feed through or into the wing. Through the PFD cutout, there's lots of room to maneuver. The GEA24 is mounted here while the entrance light timer is mounted next to it. These are the wires for the Smart Glide switch that mounts from the front. The PFD and Ed Hart's pigtails are long enough to pull the PFD out from the front and get to the connectors. This eliminates any need to climb under the panel to release the connectors. Then here is the nose camera coax, while I left the Ad Hart's connector open for the temp sensor wires from the wing. This is the ELT connector, while the pedo, static, and AOA tubes are provided with big loops to avoid any kinking. The main harness down the right side of the cockpit area was secured with ADO clamps every 10 inches or so, with tie wraps keeping everything tidy in between. I ran two separate wire bundles here for a couple reasons. First to keep them small to allow clearance under the seat and also keeping the ELT and common antenna cables away from each other. Continuing on to the radio shelf, here's the GPS 28 WAS interface with its CAN bus terminator, the PFD backup battery, nav and strobe light power pack with room in the ADL clamps for wires from the wing, which includes a ground pigtail for the wire shields from the wing. Then there's the COM coax going to the antenna, and the GPS antenna coax with a loop to accommodate a minimum length called for in the Garmin installation manual. Here's the pedo and angle of attack poly lines routed through the structure, with the all-important water traps teed at the lowest point. Then it was time for the big move. 
Since I was having one of the big commercial van lines move our stuff to Texas, I needed to really pack the airplane well with lots of padding. I needed to ensure that all the loose objects in the fuselage didn't bounce around, which first required stuffing all the loose wire harnesses into plastic bags and bubble wrap, then tying them all back to sturdy structure. I also secured anything loose as to not wear down any powder coat. Yes, this is where the cheap zip ties come into good use, as they will be temporary and not a permanent part of the airplane. Then I encased the entire fuselage in pool noodles, nearly buying out the entire stock at two Target stores. I did leave a couple for the kids though, I promise. Then with a little help, we encased the entire fuselage in that cellophane stretch wrap stuff, while also including big pads underneath for the whole thing to rest on in the truck. I also padded and wrapped the tail feathers, doors, and wings using the same method. I was really nervous about packing all this in a moving truck, but the movers were careful and carefully built a shell around everything. At the time of this video, the airplane successfully made it into self-storage and we'll see if there's any damage after I get to my eventual shop and unwrapped. But I don't expect any problems as I packed it super well. Fingers crossed. I really miss working on the airplane, but life gets in the way. It is a hobby after all. Thank you.